Are you ready to kick it off? One minute till. One minute till? You are jumping the gun. I'm jumping the gun. We're all going to roll in the door in one minute. Okay. So, in case you don't know where you are, this is the St. Louis Ruby Meetup Group, in case you walked in on the street. I'm Chris Gore, and I'm going to talk to you about Lambda Calculus. And what I'm going to use to describe it is Ruby, because I'm assuming that you probably have some familiarity with it. And it's really difficult sometimes to explain math unless there's a different analog, and English is really a bad analog for most math. But computer science is sometimes a decent analog for math, especially when it's about computation. So my bachelor's was actually in math, and I love math. It's fun. It's great. Um, math is not doing your taxes. That's arithmetic, and hardly even that. Math is really about discovering patterns. If you want to know what math is, look at a fractal. That's mathematics. That's what mathematics is really supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about finding beauty, finding similarities, finding flow in the universe. And it's the simplest way to talk about whatever you're talking about. And if it seems complicated, it's because it's discussing something that's actually a complicated subject. It's not that the math is complicated, it's that what it's talking about is complicated. And it's usually pretty distilled. Now that makes it kind of confusing because you have it shrunk down to the tiniest little nugget that describes what you're trying to talk about. But it can also be confusing because math has some really bad notation. You know, the, our current notation dates back to the 1700s and it needs some work. There's some really bad textbooks out there. Then there's some really bad teachers out there. And sometimes you're the problem, but most people know. <laughs> um, so computer science is also mathematics. Computer programming is not computer science, and you'll sometimes hear arguments that, well, therefore, computer programmers should not study computer science. Well, that's not true either, because that's kind of like saying engineers shouldn't study physics. Well, you know, somebody driving down a bridge kind of appreciates if the engineer understands a little bit about physics, just a little bit. And um, it's not software engineering. And even better, it's not science. It's better than that. It's math. Math is better than science. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. Right? With like a greater than sign. Yeah. Science. It'll be awesome. <laughs> it probably exists. I need to get one. I'll wear it next time. Limited press. Limited press. No, it's probably pretty well published. Uh, Computer science, it, what computer science actually is, is the, it's a branch of mathematics that describes not computers and not computer programming, but computation, which is what computers do. And what you write a program, you're making computation happen. And computer science actually is describing the very concept of computation happening. Lambda calculus. So 
There's the word calculus, and lots of people think instantly calculus. Oh, okay, I'm going to integrate some things, or differentiate some things, or find the area under some curve, or make a bridge, or whatever I'm going to do. Well, the thing is, is so you're, you're used to algebra, and there's calculus, right? Well, there's actually an infinite number of algebras, and there's an infinite number of calculi. Uh, and the one that you get taught in calculus class, that's, that's one of them. Here's another one. It's called lambda calculus. Um, the reason why this was made is to discuss computation. And even though it's complicated, it's actually a lot simpler than a lot of the other ways to discuss this, these kind of things. Uh, mostly Turing machines. Turing machines are a real pain to actually try and do anything with. This is so simple and so compact that you can very quickly, uh, it, it's just basically, the simpler a system is, the easier it is to think about it, do proofs with it, all that kind of stuff. And the guy who made it is this guy right here, Alonzo Church. Uh, he also invented church numerals, which we'll discuss here a little bit. Church Booleans, they're both named after him. Lambda Calculus, for some reason, is not called Church Calculus, but there you go. Uh, lambda Calculus, as I said, it's really small. It's really small. It's the, that's it. That's Lambda Calculus. This is just some words to help explain. Three tiny little equations, and you've got Lambda Calculus. And since we've already seen all of lambda calculus, I guess we're done, right? Yay. Yay. No, not really. Because it's, like I said, math can sometimes be dense. And this is intentionally as dense as you can get computation. So let's, let's talk through these things. So first off, some background information about lambda calculus. Uh, so it is the smallest way you can discuss programming. And it is in the, and because of that, it's actually the smallest universal programming language that there is. Uh, Church, he made it up in the 1930s, and later on some work after that. Uh, it's Turing complete because it is a programming language. It's a full-fledged programming language. And it only has one thing that it does, and that is variable substitution to do transformations. That's all it does. There's nothing else it's capable of doing. But that's all you need, so it's okay. So if we go back to this slide, you see there's, um, it's basically just three definitions, what an expression is, what a function is, and what an application is. And if you see an expression, it's got, it's either a name, a function, or an application, right? So, well, let's talk about names. Names are the easiest part. It's basically just like a symbol in Ruby. Uh, and because, because mathematicians can't agree on how to do say, talk about things, it's got other names. Names have other names. Among those names for names are names, variables, and atoms. Uh, tokens are also used, and you'll invariably run into a few more, just to be extra clear. That's the way we do things. Yeah. So yeah, symbols. Symbols in Ruby are basically a kind of an analog to names in lambda calculus. Expressions, that's the big deal right here. Expressions are everything in lambda calculus. If we're talking about a name, if we're talking about a function, if we're talking about an application, those are all expressions. So it basically covers everything that exists in this, in this little language. So if we go about a function, right, we've, we've all used functions when we write code. And uh, the functions here, they're, well, they're also, also called uh, abstractions. But basically what's happening is it's a pure function. So it's entirely all this thing is doing is taking in some inputs and transforming it and spitting it out. There's no side effects. There's no, uh, so there's no, not going to be a printlin. There's not going to be any, like, twiddling some memory on the background. There's going to be none of that kind of stuff. So, and the syntax we use is this kind of thing. So here we're defining a function that takes in a name and it maps to some expression. And it can be any name and it can go to any expression. 
And as we already said, expressions are literally everything. So basically, you can go in a function from a single name to literally everything in Lambda Calculus. Uh, the name part is called the argument, and that's, that's a common term also in programming, as you call them the arguments to your function, or parameters, or there's other terms. And all of those terms will be used in Lambda Calculus too, by, uh, just by relating it to each other. The expression that it maps into, that's the body of the function. And that kind of makes sense too, if you think about, you know, you often, in, when you're programming, you'll call that the body of your function the stuff that actually happens in the function. Pretty much all the syntax that's actually in Lambda Calculus is just for functions. You have the Lambda and the, and the period. And that's just to say, I'm starting a function and you know, I'm separating the name from the expression. The, and Ruby is actually pretty good to explain what's actually going on here because of uh, anonymous Lambdas. So, the basic translation of that is a stabby lambda like that, where you just are taking a single variable n, and you do some expression e on it. Uh, a few other kind of irritating things. Oh, well, wait, that's next. Um, so the applications, the main point of applications is so that, is so that expressions can kind of blossom out like a tree. That's the real purpose of it. But Applications are what you're doing with functions. You apply a function to an expression, and therefore you do the substitution. So, like if you wanted to do, if you wanted to, do, so what you what you typically are actually doing in lambda calculus is you have a function over on this side, and you'll have some expression, and you apply that function to that expression, and that's the actual operation that's going on. And that's applica function application is all of the real computation that's happening in the system. It's basically you take some expression, you apply a function to it, and then you've generated a new expression, which you typically apply a new function to and generate a new expression. So you can use parens to give yourself some clarity, but if you don't have parens, it uses the left association rule. So, so say you had three expressions, right? Well, if you just had two, right, we already said you'd have this, this expression applied to this expression, right? So if you have e1, e2, e3, you do this for order first. So first you apply this to this, then you have a new expression, and all expression, and you can then apply this expression to the third, and of course this chains to either however many expressions you've got. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of weird how this works until you get some real practice with it. And if if it's something's unclear, if you actually were trying to walk walk through some uh, work to out examples, typically the best thing to do is just put parens and map it out because it it makes it it makes it really terse, but sometimes it makes it too terse and you're just confused as to what's going on. But once you get used to it, it's nice. So simplest function we can do, right? Well, probably the simpl second simplest function I guess we can do. Uh, identity. You just take what you have and pass it through. It sounds like a useless function, but it's actually really not. Uh, Ruby has identity, I believe, right? Well, if not, it's easy to write because it's just, just uh, that's all there is to it. It's just a stabby lambda that takes in x and spits out x again. So when we actually write out an application of a function to an expression, so say we wanted to apply the identity to, the, so the, here's the identity function. We wanted to apply it to y. The syntax that you usually use is these brackets notation. And what you're doing there is you're saying, now, now there's two forms of this, and what you're saying is basically, for every x in the expression that follows, stick a y there. Because what you're doing is you're applying this, and you're sticking in that. And of course that becomes y. 
It's because it just passes through. Uh, and just to confuse you, there's a backwards notation as well. <laughs> Depending on, about half the books use this, and about the other half the books use that. So, as of yesterday, the Wikipedia page uses this one, which I don't like. And I'm sure tomorrow it'll be the other way around, because that's Wikipedia. So, how would you do this application in Ruby? It's still pretty simple, right? So you've got your step, you've got your stabby lambda right here. That's your identity function, and that just passes through whatever, and you just pass it in uh, some sort of name like y. And since all this is doing is passing it through, you get the y split back out. So super simple. Now, some more terms. We've got the, the function, I mean, the, the, name, the name that's here is known as a bound variable because it's actually going to be changing inside the body. It's bound to something coming in from the expression that it gets applied to. The y here, that's a free variable because there's nothing over here messing with it. And here is got to be one of the most confusing things. It goes all the way back to, where is it at? This guy, right? So, you know, in each, uh, each algebraic expression, you typically have at, you know, x or y or theta or whatever. And it's going to change, and that's okay. But that's nothing compared to how confusing this is. This x has nothing to do with this x at all. The left side of the expression's x is completely separate from the right hand sides of the expression's x and that really sucks a lot as you can imagine. And you'll, especially if you have, a, you know, it's, it's a little bit confusing and it's just two incredibly simple expressions. You can just imagine if it was something complicated. So what you typically do in that case is what's known as an alpha, an alpha reduction, but we'll talk about that later. So being as simple as it is, one of the things you can't do is you can't even name your functions at all in Lambda Calculus. There's just no way to do it. It's just not part of the language. But since this is typically something you do on paper, that's not a problem because you'll just say, you know, I, I is the identity function. And the, the syntax is typically capital, bold-faced, or double-struck letters, depending on, you know, or blackboard bold. So you'll see this, but it's not actually part of Lambda Calculus. In actual Lambda Calculus, you're going to have to actually expand all of this out manually, every single step, which is kind of irritating. The other irritating thing is there's only ever one argument to a function. There's never two, there's never five, there's never zero, there's always just one. And how we get around that is we do currying, which if you've been exposed to functional programming, you've probably seen some currying before. But here it's absolutely necessary to get anything done. And so we'll talk about currying in just a little bit. Okay, so alpha equivalence. This is basically what you do whenever you have um, variables in expressions that don't that match up. You just switch them out because they're completely equivalent. So this identity function here, I'm defining it in terms of x, but that doesn't mean anything. I can use y, or z, or smiley, or whatever I want. So if I had an expression like this, right, that's got, I'm applying it to y, but there's already a y inside here. The, the easiest way to handle it is you just take, you get rid of one of the y's. So so in here, I've just switched out the y with a w, and then I'm not going to run into the, as much confusion because of that. Now, what's kind of weird is, is then you might get a production that, you know, you might get you might get some letter, you might get w instead of y, but it's actually equivalent in some strange way because it's not about the symbols that get produced; it's about the flow. It's about the computation, not what gets computed. And that's, that's one of the things that's really weird about this coming from, you know, when you program a computer, you're usually trying to make something happen to something. And 
when you're doing lambda calculus, you're not really concerned with that. You're more concerned with things are happening. There's this flow. There's this circuit. There's this. You're you're more interested in the movement than the result. So it's okay if it ends up popping out as a W instead of a Y, because that's not the objective. Is to the the outcome is not what you're really interested in. Um, so beta reductions are basically what you're doing when you have when you're trying to do the reduction when you're trying to do the uh, basic when you're trying to do these bracketing notation that's basically a beta reduction uh, and here's the other syntax that I was talking about so if you actually pull up the Wikipedia page you'll see this like that right and here's another irritating thing is it's on the other side of the equation or the other side of the T so what we're saying here is I've got this function that turns the input and instead it just returns a T on an S well, we can say either replace all x's with s like this on t, or we can say on t replace all x's with s. The, the nice thing about this is it kind of looks like the old style assignments in, I think it was, was that Pascal that looked like this? Yeah? What's the difference between beta reduction and application? Well, the application is technically what's going on here. You're applying this function, or this. You're applying this expression to this expression, right? The reduction is the process of the substitution. Is is you're, when you reduce the the expression to a different express, expression. It's basically a way to produce. It's basically saying you can do this and get something out of it and get an equivalent expression. You reduce one expression to a different expression. The application, so yeah, application is basically just, an application is just two expressions side by side, and one gets applied to the other. The reduction is a way to turn uh, an application into a different expression. So basically doing the replacement, that's the reduction. The expression is just having them sitting there side by side. And um, beta re if you actually were in a class, you'd be doing a lot of beta reductions, a lot of just manipulations, just basically like arithmetic, and just hating yourself while you're doing it. So here's a very short example that I stole from the internet, because I didn't want to actually have to work one out my head on my own. And that's actually pretty simple. And basically what you're seeing here is that all of this nonsense is this, uh, let me see if I can actually select this. All of this, yeah, do it, do it, do what I tell you. All of the stuff to the left of this X that I can't select is equivalent to identity. Right down there. And you, you've reduced it through beta reductions. Well, actually, this part is the beta reduction, and then you get an equivalence, and then a beta reduction, and then an equivalence, and so on and so forth. Then you're like, oh, all this nonsense is just identity. Okay. And since wherever I stole this from the internet, this guy on GitHub um, used the kind I don't like, I reformatted it. Yeah, there you go. And again, it, you still find its identity. Okay, so like I said, there's only ever one and no more or no less than one argument's going into a function here in the lambda calculus. So we use currying. And what is currying? Well, it's not actually a feature of lambda calculus. It's just a convention, just like using those bold struck eyes. And the concept is, well, if I want two, if I want two arguments for my function, I'll just write this. And I'll know what I actually mean is I'm I have a function that spits out a function which is, which sounds a little confusing, but it's not really because honestly, everything everything in this is a function. There is nothing that's not a function in this entire thing. And so, your first argument is the argument for the first function, and the second argument is the argument for the second function. So if you have x y going to y, what you actually have is x going to y going to y, and that actually works. 
so surprisingly. Now, curry isn't just in Indian restaurants, it's also in Ruby. And what's actually going on is, so here's some example code. We've, this is basically uh, an equivalent expression to identity. And so as you can see, if you pass it in Hausa, you get Hausa back. If you pass it in Y, you get Y back. Whatever you pass it in, you get back. But there actually is, so you can do the application, but you can actually call curry in Ruby, or at least since 1.9 you can, if you're so inclined. And what you're actually doing is, when you curry, you're setting what, you're making, a, you take a function in Ruby, and you say, okay, give me that, take that function, but give me something that takes that function, sticks a value in, for the first or the leftmost argument, which in this case is the only argument, and and stick that in it, and then return that function, which they can then can call. So this ends up being also identity. So that's two of many ways to do currying in Ruby. One where you actually type curry. So so far we haven't done any actual like logical thought or anything like that. It's just translation and just transformation. But you can easily define functions that become true and false. And again, it's a purely convention. There's no hard and fast rules here. What you end up doing is you define a function true and you define a function false. And all they do is they take two arguments and those two arguments are two expressions one expression to return in the case of the true case, and another expression to return in the case of the true false case. And true is always returning the true case one, and false is always returning the false case one. And that's all there is to it. In Ruby, it's also really crazy, simple and short. You do the same thing. You just have a function that takes in two arguments, the true and the false, and it returns it. And as long as what you're passing this in is also a uh, function, a lambda, it'll spit out the, either the true or the false, whichever one you need. And you do the same for the false. And so, for example, of what this would do is if you passed it in the, the true, these two things, you'd get the one that you'd do for the true, or vice versa for the false. And once you have that, once you have true and false, you can define logical and or not. The Boolean operations. Now, the reason why these work is because this is a function. Everything is everything is a function, and that's why this actually works. So, what this is basically saying is, give me two things x and y, which are assumed to be either Boolean true or false. And what you basically, if x in other words, if the first one is true, then return y, which is either true or false, which makes sense, right? Because and is, if both x and y are true, then it's true. Uh, but if x, is uh, if x is false, it does the false thing, which is just a returning a false, which is, so it uses, it, it uses the fact that the argument that gets passed in is a function in order to even function as a function. <laughs> and it's the same way for the false, right? If the first one is true, then it's just done. We're true, okay? But if, so if you can, you can almost see this as like, if x, then y, else f. If x, then t, then true, else y, right? And inversion is even simpler. It just takes in a single argument, and it just says, if x is true, because we know that x is a Boolean, otherwise we're not going to be doing this operation on it, then false. Otherwise true. So you just switch it around. And you can do this in Ruby too. Really short definitions. So assuming you still have true and false from back here defined, you can define logical and, logical or, logical not, and I'm sticking L's in front of it because and or not, of course, are still there. So I can't 
rename it, and just take in two, and assuming x, the first argument, is a function, which by convention it is, we can call it on the second argument and then false, which is also a function. So this is x is a function, y is a function, f is a function, and it knows that and it can call it these things on on the other side of the equa of the uh, argument. Or works the same way, and not is also just incredibly simple. And so, for example, if you do logical not on true, you get the lambda back for the t, which has hasn't been evaluated in this case. You'll just you'll just get lambda and then like a long serial number for the lambda is what will actually get printed. And if you do L not on false, you'll get the T back. Yeah? So these functions have two arguments. Uh, so is this just shorthand for the Yeah, three? yeah, because if I were to actually have the Ruby being all like one argument, it, it, it would blow up really quickly. So I'm, I'm not, so, so you, one thing you can do, and it might be fun if you're so inclined, is you can actually define, and several people have done it, a working lambda calculus thing, like a little, either a, a pile of classes or a whatever, you know, whatever suits your fancy, that is a working lambda calculus unit, and then you can actually use it to do stuff. It's silly, but you can do it. It might even be fun, depending on your motivation. Um, I'm not really trying to do that. I'm basically just aiming at being like, okay, because this stuff is very terse and, can, and does, it, it does, it's not self-explanatory at all, but if you see it down here, I'm hoping, if you see it in the Ruby, I'm hoping you can see what's actually happening. Because, yeah, if you just see this, you know, I, don't, I, I wouldn't get that the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time. But if I see this, hey, I know Ruby. It's a computer. I know this one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this actually this actually works as it is, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the purpose of the Ruby in these slides is not really to be useful Ruby. It's to be just uh, to show you what's going on. Yeah. So since we've got and or not done, and we can do Boolean. Let's let's do arithmetic. So there's no numbers in this. There's just functions applying onto functions. But that's okay because numbers just show up everywhere you are. If it's logical thought, if it's things happening in somebody's brain, like math, numbers just happen. And this is one of those cases where numbers just happen. They just appear out of the ether, right? We can just say, let's have a zero. You know, what's my zero look like? Well, it's some function z the z function, that's my zero function. And we need some function that's the next number, the successor, right? So basically an add one function, which I'm gonna call my successor function, which is this s, right? So what's my zero? It's just a function that takes in a successor and a zero function. So basically the thing you want to do, so basically you need two functions to use these numbers. For the first thing you need is the thing that you want to do each application for each succession, and then you need the terminating guy, the zero guy. Right? So all zero does is zero. What does one do? It does, it applies the successor to zero, because one is one more than zero. What does two do? It applies the successor to the successor of zero. And so forth. Forever. Yeah? Does your zero function matter? Because I've seen other ones looking up. Uh, well, in the case, in the case of, well, in this case, it is, the zero is an identity, but since this is, so here's, here's the thing, right? Everything is a function. Everything is applicable to everything else. Every function will work as a zero function. And that's one of the cool things. So if you want to loop, if you want to iterate, what you do is you apply a church near world to the thing you want to loop, right? So if, if you gave it a zero, if you basically wanted to do something 10 times and then in the terminating condition do something else, you know, so let's say you wanted to print, 
99 bottles of beer on the wall and so on. And eventually, you know, your zero condition will be we're all out of beer, right? The zero functions that we're all out of beer, the, all the rest of them are just the print in bottles of beer on the wall. And you can do this for any loop. So it's basically a loop and a terminator. So like this. Here's church numerals in Ruby. And this actually works too. Although it took me a little bit of trouble trying to figure out how to get the actual generic one to actually re realize itself. But so in the case of zero, I'm just defining a function that takes in a successor function and a zero function. And all it does is the zero function. That's basically what's going to go on. Although actually there should be a pair of brackets here. I forgot them. Yeah, well. uh, on the one, we apply that. And the two, we apply that twice and so forth, right? So the general form, here's the general form, is now I'm cheating here and I'm using actual integers to count down. But if you really were so inclined, you could actually make this happen with church numerals too. It would probably be a little bit longer of a slide for that. But yeah, you could have this be totally just like tied in on itself right here and then have n be a church numeral thing. So cn takes in a church numeral here. But yeah. So if n, so basically if n is equal to zero, just do the zero function, which here I'm also, like I said, I'm passing it in no arguments. I'm assuming it takes nothing. Otherwise, what do you do? Give it the successor function that you passed in. Bring down one, uh, bring down n, and then do the successor on the zero function forever. So if you do, if you do, if you have these two functions, so we're going to use the hausa as the successor function, and you have this hey as the zero function, you're going to get printed to your screen hausa 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 hey if you call that, and that actually works. It just prints them four times. And then it brings it down and prints the last one, and then it's done. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an inherent loop because it's basically unrolling from the ifs. And I'm actually going to stick this in, uh, if I can select, I'm going to stick this in Ruby because I want to see that. Uh, where are we at? Bigger term. How do I make the font bigger on this guy? There you go. All right. Is that good? A little bit bigger? How's that? Good. Okay, cool. Um, oh, I probably actually do want to be there. Here we go. Okay, so will that work? Yep, okay. So there you go. And if I give it like just one, there you go. You just get the one. You can get the zero. There you go. Just the hey. And so it's it's basically the idea is a number, an integer number, a positive integer number what you're actually having happen is it's the concept of a loop happening. That flow is the number. Basically, it's what's going on. And you're translating that back, and, and it works like a different algebra. You can pretend it's a number, and it is a number. So it's good enough. It, you can have all of arithmetic of this, including, well, so you have, so here's the standard definitions for your successor function your addition, your multiplication, your exponentiation is actually the shortest, which is pretty cool because what you're, so, so this is one of the things that I thought was pretty cool is, yeah, exponentiation is the easiest of them all to write because basically what's happening is you're applying a number onto a number and that just, there you go, it just, it just basically multiply yourself that many times. So it's the shortest of them all which is pretty neat. Subtraction is really difficult. Well, not, not really difficult, but it's like, 
I, I'd be up here a good 20 minutes if I wanted to even touch subtraction. Basically what it boils down to is you need to, so you've got, you need to ha define a, instead of a successor function, you need to find a predecessor function and that's like difficult. Uh, it's in one of the, in one of the slides I refer, and one of the PDFs I reference in this, in this slide set, somebody goes through it. It's, it's maybe about a page or two, but it's kind of convoluted in what you have to do to just get that thought happening because these, these numbers here, they only do zero and up. There is no a negative number. There's no, there's no way to do negative numbers. And without the negative numbers, you can't easily do subtraction. But once you get that predecessor function, you can have subtraction and then you can have negative numbers. And then of course you're gonna do division after that and so forth. Floating point numbers, well, even if you aren't limiting yourself to such a ridiculous machine as this, Floating point numbers are just a real pain. You know, I don't know if you've ever looked at like the floating point standard, whatever it is, I triple E seven hundred something. Uh, but if you ever have to like deal with that document and care, you are gonna hate yourself for a while. I, uh, I speak from personal experience. There, it is not fun. Floating points are a bad idea, but they exist and they're necessary, unfortunately. But you can, but since if you have uh, positive and negative integers, you obviously can do floating point numbers because that's all we really have in hardware is really just a bunch of bytes, right? So it makes perfect sense that you can do it. And yeah, it's been done. I don't have a reference for that, but I'm sure if you look around, you can find it. Uh, and pretty much everything else you could possibly really want to do with this thing is a pain. It, it really is. The only thing that this is really good at is if you want to do proofs about computation, because you're a computer science slash mathematician who likes to do proofs about things all day, then it's great. Because it's so tiny, it's just three tiny little equations, it just rolls in on itself everywhere, it's just perfect for that. But if you actually want to use it as a tool to get something done, yeah, it's just not the best choice. I actually built the primitives for Lisp out of it. Oh yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah, I there. That was I saw that where somebody was doing like yeah. They basically built uh, the linked list and then you want to go from there. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. That was actually a lot easier than trying to do like subtraction. <laughs> so. <laughs> so then you do subtraction in your new list. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. So. Does it kind of look like Haskell? I don't know. It kind of looks like Haskell. When I look at well, it. Oh, in the, in the, in the, only in the fact that it's a little bit difficult to read, yeah, <laughs> and it's useless. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. yeah. What's up? Uh, so Corey Haynes has been tweeting the past couple of weeks, implementing this and Ruby uh, church numbers. He's got subtraction. Uh, looks like he's working on. Uh, Tuples and lists right now. Okay. So you, can do, you can do lists. Uh, I think they might be called church lists or something like that. Yeah. What do you think you do? There's conventions for, for that as well. Yeah. Um, and I, when I was looking for that, um, Jim Myrick did some of these work. Mm -hmm. He has a really good presentation in the Y Com. Oh yeah, that would be like just one talk on its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was a <laughs> keynote at the Ruby conference. Yeah, one of these. So on the on the GitHub repo for these slides, which are linked in the meetup, I've got some of the uh, references I was using, and one of the really good ones was uh, uh the Rojas one. I think he had. Let me make this big. There you go. No, not that big. This big. Uh, and we can't read that. <laughs> Does he talk about division? Yeah, here you go. So here's the predecessor function. And then, then it's a little bit easier after you get that guy figured out. Uh, here's, is this the Y Combinator? Yeah. That is the Y Combinator. Yeah, okay, there you go. Here's the Y Combinator. Which is what you need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Any other comments? Any other insults to Haskell? No? <laughs> And uh, here's the references that I have. Why don't you do it? So what else is in the Lambda Calculus each area that you haven't covered? You said you mentioned uh, Y Combinator. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the Y Combinator, is that that's just a one-liner right uh, here. How do I zoom that in? There we go. That's that guy. And it, it, it's... Oh, yeah, like uh, the vast majority of computer science. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is this is like a perfect example, right? It's so tiny of a little equation, and it does... It's just like so fundamental. If you try to implement uh, the results, it's not a good thing. Oh, what does it do? I, I didn't um, even will, give it a shot. Just step up, up because it uh, applies the arguments first. Yeah, we don't have uh, tail recursion. You have to have uh, TCO tail call optimization. Well, no, it's uh, the because of the call semantics. It will it applies the arguments before actually, before actually whether, it's, calls. whether it's needed or not. Oh, okay. So what you actually have to do if you're going to implement in Ruby is actually put an extra layer of function in there. So uh, something more along. We can probably do the camera if you like, somehow. Let me make the camera happen. Uh, zoom, zoom will do that. So I think this is called the Z Combinator. Start with, yeah. Will this work? Hi. Hi, me. <laughs> yeah, so that hey, guy, yeah. so it's kind of like the top part is you're taking in some function that you want to be able to have recursive. Then the first part is just duplicating like this, uh, the bottom line. So now x is going to be this, this bottom function itself. And then it takes in one more argument. And then you apply f and passing in like that, that whole thing again. And then the one argument that you want to take as a parameter. Cool. So that would allow you to actually recurse without like, just keep going down, down the out the Y Combinator. Okay. I don't know. I, I still don't really get monads other than like the philosophical like Neoplatonic definition. Like the monad begat the dyad and the dyad begat the triad and the triad begat the tetriad and the tetriad eventually begat the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The more you go into this, the more you will do these. <laughs> that's 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 the end state of like doing this kind of stuff. So is it showing our age to recognize that from the Atari basic cartridge? <laughs> it, it is. It is. Yes. <laughs> what kind of computers on the right? Uh, I don't know. Some just page box on the side. Yeah. <laughs> but the keyboard, I, I think I do recognize the keyboard. Oh yeah, I'll model M. Perhaps. That's huh? That's inquiring. Anything else?